phase two of nine beast. I really, really, really appreciate the suggestion to do a uh, history of coffee. And uh, I hope this is sufficient. It's more like facts, but and, and uh, a little fiction and myth. But I hope you like it. history of coffee. It dates back to the 1400s and possibly earlier with a, with a number of reports about a legend of its origin, of its finding. The native origin of coffee is thought to have been in Ethiopia, actually. The earliest substantiated evidence of either coffee drinking or knowledge of coffee of uh, the tree is from the 14th century. No, sorry, the 15th century. It's in the Sufi monasteries of Yemen. By the 16th century, it had reached the rest of middle of the Middle East, South India. Persia and Turkey, the Horn of Africa, and even Northern Africa. Coffee then spread to the Balkans, Italy, and then the rest of Europe, to uh, Southeast Asia, but they already had tea. And then finally, Lastly, to, to America, to America. On History Extra, History Extra dot com. And this was about, uh, relating. Oh, this is the fish, official website for BBC History Magazine and BBC World Histories magazine. Hmm. Um, but there's a book. A book called A Drink for the Devil. A Drink for the Devil by Paul Crystal. So we think coffee may have actually been discovered by goats. Legend has it that Kaldi, K-A-L, a lonely goat herder in the 9th century Ethiopia so Ethiopia in the 800s this is like 1200 years ago in Africa 
East Africa. According to the legend, Kaldi discovered the energizing and invigorating effects of coffee when he saw his goats getting excited after eating some berries from a tree. Kali told the abbot of the local monastery about this, and the abbot came up with the idea of trying and boiling the berries to make a beverage. Make a nice beverage. He threw the berries into the fire whence the unmistakable aroma, the unmistakable aroma. Drifted into the night air, and the now roasted beans were raked from the ashes and the embers, ground up and dissolved in hot water, and so was made the world's first cup of coffee. And the abbot and his monks found that the, the beverage kept them awake for hours, completely awake for hours at a time. Sufi mystic, Sufi mystic named, uh, God, thank God I drank my coffee for this one. Ooh, I always love it's been thundering outside and, uh, it always seems to rumble right at some weird time, but I don't know. Humans were good at interpreting things to make sense, even when they don't, so. Maybe it doesn't. But the Yemenite Sufi mystic named Gotul Akbar Nuruddin Abu Al Hassan El Shadhili. Gotul Akbar Nuruddin Abu Al Hassan Al Shid Shahi. Oh, I almost got it. Shadhili. I hope he had a nickname as a claim to the discovery of coffee. He is said to have spotted berry-eating birds flying over his village, unusually energetically. And on tasting some of the jettisoned berries, I don't know what that means, he, he too found himself unusually alert. Nice. And, um, you know, my girlfriend's cousin actually was saying the other day that he has a high sensitivity to, um, to caffeine, and he had to stop drinking coffee. And it's, I found out on this website, caffeineinformer.com, that caffeine sensitivity is determined by the efficiency of the human body to process and metabolize caffeine. So, and this is actually different from the uh, caffeine tolerance of an individual, which is how the body responds to caffeine over time. Sensitivity. Sensitivity has more to do with a person's unique genetic makeup as this determines 
to what degree a given amount of caffeine will affect a person. So the genetic link is that caffeine is metabolized by the liver using the enzyme CYP1A2. The ability to produce this enzyme is regulated by the CYP1A2 gene. And slight changes in the DNA sequence of this gene determine how efficiently a person can metabolize caffeine and thus eliminate it from the body. Some people genetically produce very little of this enzyme, while others produce a large amount, but most people um, fall right somewhere in the middle. So it fa it, it's found that, um, according to a study, let's see, number two. According to gbhealthwatch.com a study called Trait Caffeine Consumption that ten percent of the population are rapid caffeine metabolizers And thus not very caffeine sensitive. So 10%. Um, I must be in the 10% because, man, it takes a lot to get me feeling all tweaked out. I just, uh, I really have to wake, wake and take a cup of, uh, a couple of beans, grind them up, press them down, drink them up. Up, down. So the third genetic link to caffeine sensitivity involves the type of aden adenosine receptors a person has in his or her brain. Those lacking the correct adenosine receptors in the brain are, are unresponsive to the awakening effects of caffeine because the caffeine molecule can't properly can't properly bind to the receptor sites. And, um, so when you, in, in science, there's a prefix, we all know it, it's hyper, um, like hyperactive, and then there's hypo, like hypoallergenic. Hyper means extremely. It means like, so it, um, of course, is relative to the word that it's prefix for. And in this case, we're talking about hypersensitivity to caffeine. And it's an ex exaggeration, it's an excessiveness of the word app that it's connected to. And so, uh, so the hypersensitivity would mean that from the regular sensitivity, they're especially sensitive. And these people react to very small amounts of caffeine. than 100 milligrams. People who are very sensitive to caffeine can experience, can actually experience overdose symptoms such as insomnia, jitters, and increased heartbeat. It can take as much as twice as long for caffeine to be metabolized for these types of So, right in the middle, which is the majority 
uh, people, 200 to 400 milligrams of caffeine daily um, won't cause any adverse reactions. And these people have no trouble sleeping as long as the caffeine is consumed early enough in the day. And then lastly, hyposensitivity. Hypo, like hypothermia, means thermia meaning heat. Hypo means instead of hyper being more and excessive, hypo is a lack of. So hypothermia would be a lack of heat or thermia. Therm, 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 thermal. Um, so hyposensitive people actually don't have much adverse reactions at all. Um, and this is, again, about 10%, 10% of the population on the, on the other side of the sensitivity, caffeine sensitivity spectrum. And they can process caffeine so efficiently that they can take over 500 milligrams without much effect at all. So, I think my dad is actually like, So, back to um, the lore of caffeine, an alternative story from the, uh, the goats and the birds in, uh, in Yemen or uh, Ethiopia is that um, coffee was first discovered by a sheik named Omar. Disciple to the Sufi mystic cited above. So while in exile from Mocha, which uh, Arabia Felix, which is Arabia Felix in present day Yemen, Omar was um, who was famous for his ability to cure the sick through prayer. by the uh, 16th century coffee was a beverage it was the beverage of choice in Persia, Egypt, Syria and Turkey its reputation as the wine of Araby its reputation as the wine of Araby boosted no end by the thousands of pilgrims visiting the holy city of Mecca each year from all over the Muslim world. So Yemeni merchants, Yemeni, I don't know, took coffee home from Ethiopia and began to, began to grow it for themselves. It was prized by Sufis in Yemen who used it as a drink aid for the concentration. It has a spiritual intoxicant also used it to keep themselves alert during their nighttime devotions. And from the Middle East, the population. 
popularity of coffee soon spread throughout the Balkans, which is um, kind of like northern Greece, around the northeast shore of the Mediterranean, in those mountains, then to west, to Italy, and to the rest of Europe. Then it worked its way equally far east into Indonesia and west overseas to to America and largely um, this was through the Dutch and I think I screwed up I conflated Dutch with the Danish so Danish are from Denmark Dutch are weirdly enough from the Netherlands but you you probably So, see if this sounds any better. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll switch over to these crinkles. Try not to overdo them, but, um, sorry it's so late in the, uh, in, into the video that I'm shouting you out, but I just wanted to be, give a big thank you to actually, wow, just, just the other day, actually, just yesterday, Phase Beast, exactly, uh, it's actually Phase with a PH, 209 Beast, so, Phase 209 Beast, I really, really, really appreciate the suggestion to do a uh, history. is sufficient. It's more like facts, but, and, and uh, a little fiction and myth, but I hope you like it. I really, really like these sounds. So, the fact so, so powerful, it caused it to for, forge a social revolution. Coffee was drunk in the home as a domestic beverage, but more significantly, it was also drunk in the ubiquitous public coffee houses meaning everywhere, just everywhere, which sprang up in villages, towns, in cities all across the Middle East, Africa, Middle East and East Africa, initially. And these coffee houses soon became all the rage where the places, place to go and socialize. Coffee drinking and conversation were complemented by all manner of entertainment from musical performances, dancing, games of chess, and uh, most crucially gossiping, arguing, and discussing the breaking news of the day as uh, in these coffee houses became known as of the wise. So, um, the place, these were the places you went if you wanted to know what was going on in your world. And the link between coffee and intellectual life had been established. So naturally, like anything that's very revolutionary and, of course, affects the cerebral um, environment in such a profound way, there's going to be conservative 
by temperament people that um, naturally don't like to upset tradition. And that's good, because you need people to uh, fight for tradition, and you need change to be properly um, implemented. You need it to prove its value before it's just accepted willy-nilly. And that's technical, technically speaking. Um, coffee, like alcohol, has a long history of prohibition, attracting fear and suspicion, and religious disquiet and hypocrisy. Had the zealots of all religions got their is open today. So, coffee drinking was banned by jurists and scholars meeting in Mecca in 1511. The opposition was led by the Meccan governor, Kahir Beg, or Kahir Beg, who was afraid. executed for his troubles by command of the sultan who rescinded the uh, prohibition. And then the sultan went on to uh, proclaim that the that coffee was in fact sacred. Well, wow. And in Cairo there was a, a similar ban in 1532 not long after that, in coffee houses and coffee warehouses were ransacked. And so, of course, from East Africa and Mecca and Saudi Arabia and the Balkans, it didn't take long for, for coffee to travel west into Europe. And Italy, Italy being a, uh, a port peninsula, the, one of the centers of trade in the, uh, medium, the medium through which a lot of exotic goods were, uh, to Europe, were imported into Europe, um, became the center of the, uh, kind of the, uh, established breeding ground. Liquor. 
adopted culturally as a, um, a thing to go out and do, and now this very entrepreneurial Jewish Englishman named Jacob opens up a coffee house in the middle 17th century, mid 17th. So it was run by a Greek man, Pasca Rosé, who in 1672 also set up a coffee stall in Paris. Pepe's, Pepe's visit to London, to the London Coffee House in 1660, and said, he and I, Colonel Slingsby, In the first time that I ever was there, I found much pleasure in it, through the diversity of company and discourse. So it's really cool that it's bringing a traditionally dis... No, dis yeah, discriminating ethnic backgrounds. So I think that's really, um, that's, that's really cool, honestly, you know, it shows that there are cultural transformations that can do good, and Coffee House was clearly, you know, relatively new, a new thing, and it, um, definitely helped form a common ground. So, for Pepe's and many other literate men, this coffee was his newspaper, his internet. In his diaries, he refers to the latest news of the conflict with the Dutch. The Comet, so he says the Comet, it must have been um, a comet that they thought was ominous in 1664. Let's, let's actually look that up. What, what comment was that? Comment. The comment over London. Okay. Oh, here we go. 
Great Plague of London, lasting from 1665 to 6 for a year, was the last major epidemic of the bubonic plague to occur in England. It happened within centuries, within the centuries-long time period of the second pandemic. An extended period of intermittent bubonic plague epidemics, which began in 1347, the first year of the Black Death. Wow, and lasted until 1750. Wow. And this great plague in the year 1665 apparently killed 100,000 people in 18 months. Wow, that's amazing. It was caused by the Yersinia pestis bacterium, which is usually transmitted through the bite of an infected rat flea. Ooh. Jeez. Um, so... Anyways, let's control F that and look for the word. Comment. Uh, yeah, during the winter, So, um, wow, in, in a span of 15 years, there were more than 3,000 coffee houses in England alone. Some even had bed and breakfasts for overnight guests. Many seemed to follow the Turkish coffee house business model, which, if they're exotic, Jerusalem Coffee House, various types of the Blackmore, or uh, Ye Blackmore's Head, and the Oriental Cigar Divan, the Sacred Head, or no, Saracen Head of Dickens fame, the Africa and Senegal Coffee House, the Sultaness, the Sultan's Head, and the Solid The nice little cherry on top is that coffee was thought to be the 16, the Viagra. Mary 
else? Habitué is someone who lodges at home, but he lives at the coffee house. He converses with newspapers, gazettes, and votes more than with uh, than with his shop books. Oh, oh, more than with his shop books and his constant application to the public takes him of off all care for his private home. He is always settling the nation, yet could never manage his own family. Wow, that's actually a really profound critique. I think I'll switch back. That's seriously profound. If you, uh, that's still very much interesting. Coffee, she said, made men as unfruitful as the desserts, whence the unhappy berry is said to be brought. So much that the offspring of our ancestors would dwindle into a succession of heaps and pygmies. And she was referring here to the erectile dysfunction. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. And, uh, yeah. I'm glad you had a couple sips with me. It was fun. It was really fun. And, oh, of course, Phase 209 Beast. Thanks for your suggestion, man. And, um, you know what? I think I'm going to give a special shout out.
just got locked up, but I think I can see the rest. Uh, we have Simon Smith, Ella Gregory, and uh, Luke Coupard, and Julian Bronco. Thanks, man. I actually got some Native American stuff on the way for you. Hope you like it. And uh, Wesley Heim, and Cheryl M. ASMR, and Yusuf Machu. Stefan Manage and Anders Anderson. Thank you so much. So everyone, I want you to sleep so well. Thank you for all your donations. And um, other than that, thank you for your support. Thanks for watching. And thanks for all the, you know, positive things like subs, comments. Um, I'm so sorry if I don't get to your comments. I try my best. So, um, if you have something to say, and it looks like I just maybe hearted you and skipped over it, um, I promise you I read it. But if you really want to respond, just keep keep at it, and I'll, I'll notice you. I promise.